we, we see very good what we call organic growth, which is uh, uh, the growth at the constant currency and um, driven by about 1% growth in developed markets, but uh, over 8% growth in our emerging markets, and that's obviously uh, our differentiating factor. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have some currency headwinds this quarter. Compared to last year's quarter, the dollar is, is stronger, and so that got reflected in the reported results. Um, now, I, I would say we, we, we are differentiated because of our exposure to uh, foreign markets uh, over the long term that will play into our adv advantage. But short term, you will have uh, these quarters where the currency is really not in our favor. Yeah. I want to dig into that emerging markets number. Eight and a half percent growth there. What drove that? Is that an economic story or more strategic in what you're doing on the ground? Yeah, no, no, that, I, I don't think that's an economic story. We see it across all our emerging markets. They all grew. I think it has to see with the fact that we are investing more. We're investing in more communication in our brands. We are investing more in what we call route to market. So our products are available in, in more stores. Um, we're also innovating more. And, uh, and overall, that is creating a momentum in those markets. I mean, India is up uh, mid, uh, sorry, high, uh, double digit. China is up mid single digit. Russia's up, Southeast Asia. Mexico, even Brazil, which last year was a difficult factor for us. So we, we see it across the board. There's some countries in there where uh, the economic situation is not so great, but we're in snacking. We still have a lot of open space in those markets. So that's really what's driving our growth. You know, we keep hearing the narrative on, on food companies that millennials don't want the packaged food brands of their parents, Velveeta cheese, Campbell's soup, and yet Oreo cookies are growing double digits abroad and, and single digits in this country. H how do you keep up the momentum with an old brand like that? Um, in fact, uh, Oreo is one of the most loved brands for millennials and, and for Generation Z. And, and the reason that has come to be is the, the fact that we have evolved as a brand with the times. Um, the, the, the purpose of the brand is to stay playful. And it's, it's a message about growing older, but staying yourself and enjoying yourself, spending time with those are, who are close to you. And uh, at the same time, the consumer wants more and more uh, different products. They want different flavors. They want experiences with, with brands. And we were able to, uh, in, in, in Oreo to keep on having that connection with millennials and, and Generation Z. And at the same time, as you've probably seen, we do a lot of uh, creative stuff as it relates to the product. And that really seems to be working at the moment. And, uh, and we're very happy. At the same time, our other big brand, uh, which is uh, Cadbury, uh, also grew almost double digit uh, in this quarter. It's also on a roll. Uh, those are our two biggest brands. Cadbury is more based on generosity, but that's also uh, connecting really well with the young, younger generations, and we're seeing the same effect there. So I think for what you would call old brands, it is possible to still connect to younger consumers, but, but you need to do it in line with what their expectations are. Hey, Dirk, I, I think Oreo is actually a really interesting business case study because it is playful, as you say. I was in the store the other day. I saw peanut butter filling. I'd never seen that before. Yeah. But how do you decide what flavor is too far out on a limb? And then how do you manage the sort of supply chain interruption of infusing new flavors and all that complexity that brings to the manufacturing process? Yes, yes, that's, that's a good question. When do you go too far? What's not acceptable? Of course, we do a, a, a lot of testing and, and try to hit it. Uh, last time we talked about uh, things like uh, mango Oreo or uh, spicy chicken Oreo or wasabi Oreo in China, which seem a little bit far out here. But I think that's part of what we're trying to do. We, we try to adapt to local consumer tastes. Uh, but the testing basically shows do the consumer like it and will there be enough interest in that product so that it has enough sales. It does, uh, we, we manage most of those uh, flavors with what we call in and outs. It's not a permanent item, so it's not if we do a peanut butter Oreo and it's not selling enough that that stays in our range forever, then we will take it out and put another one in. So we try to keep the supply chain complexity 
uh, as limited as possible. But, but yes, that's probably one of the biggest uh, challenges that, that we face. Uh, but that, I think, is, the, is, is what's going to make consumer goods companies successful. If you can manage that complexity, uh, it's, it's driven by what I, what I call personalization. Everybody wants what they prefer, uh, and they want it for them because that's where we are these days. If you can do that in a cost-efficient way in your supply chain, that's how you're going to win in this, uh, in this new consumer world. I mean, clearly Mondelez is very different than some of your competitors in that you purely focus on snacking and you're so internationally exposed. Three quarters, I think, of your business outside the U.S. Do you think the market is, yeah. at this point is giving you credit for that? You have been running higher than, than the food peers, but still at a multiple that's less than other consumer staples. Uh, I, I think they've been giving us credit. I think there's still uh, some upside there. Um, I, I think what has happened uh, about two years ago, our growth was, was a bit lackluster. And, and we've been saying that we want to uh, put consistent growth numbers uh, quarter after quarter. And, and we call that 3% plus is what you should be able to count on us for top line. I'm talking top line now. And, and now we've had a number of quarters where we have been close to, and this quarter we beat it. And, and we feel that the momentum is building, that we are entering into a virtuous cycle. So I think as the market will see that, that we can give that consistency in our delivery of our numbers, that's when I think we will see uh, a, a couple more turns on our multiple. Dirk, we're going to talk about pot here in, the, in another segment. Just wondering whether you've done any exploration into the CBD craze. We're sort of waiting for the big food and beverage companies to get there. We haven't seen it yet. No, we, uh, um, we have been exploring it. Um, our, our view on it is that we, we have a number of uh, family brands. Oreo would be an example. So we feel a little bit hesitant about doing anything with CBD in, in family brands. But we have other brands or new brands that we could do. So we've been looking at it. The space is not clear. I think it's, it's a bit clearer in non-food products. In food products, I, I, I'm hoping that the FDA will, will bring some clarity in the coming months. Um, so we've been looking at it. Uh, we've also been looking at what are the claimed benefits from CBD. And, and yes, we're, we're getting ready, but obviously we want to stay within uh, what is uh, legal and, and, and play it the right way. But I do think that CBD, which is... Uh, the alternative uh, of, of uh, THC, which doesn't provide you the high and so on, but which has a number of very interesting health benefits, I do think that that will be something that uh, will enter the main food space uh, in the not-so-far future. So rated R Oreos for munchies, maybe, in the future? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that I don't know yet. <laughs> Uh, um, we'll see. We'll see where that all is heading. But it, it's, it's obvious that uh, um, the edible space in, in, the, in, the, in that uh, universe is, is going to be interesting and it's something to watch. We're watching. Thank you very much, Dirk. Good to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you so much.